Salima Ibrahim, and I come to you from Edmonton, Alberta. I'm the chief of staff at the city of Edmonton and mom to three beautiful kids, age four, seven, and nine. It's my incredible pleasure today to interview three successful entrepreneurs who will be sharing their stories, both the successes as well as the hurdles of what it actually takes to be an entrepreneur. Maria Karimi joins us from Montreal, Quebec. She's a bespoke tailor, designer, and creative director of two amazing successful brands. Amina Somani joins us from Ottawa, Ontario. She is a chiropractor, the mom of three boys, and the co-founder of a company called Carb Smart Express. And Salima Villani joins us from Washington, DC. She is a founder, a CEO, an author, and an adjunct professor with a focus on entrepreneurship, innovation, and leadership. Welcome to today's session. We're very, very happy to have all of you. So I think when I think of entrepreneurship, I sometimes think of fear and uncertainty. And this is somebody who obviously works in the public sector. Um, and I really have to say, I admire people who go down this path. I think that it requires uh, courage and it, it requires a certain level of resiliency. So maybe Maria, I'll start off with you, but could you talk to us a little bit about just how you decided to put aside your fear, the uncertainty and the unknown um, to really kind of start exploring your passion. And it's obviously turned into something quite successful. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm truly honored to be here. Um, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm truly grateful because I think I'm a born optimist. Uh, so whenever I want to do something, um, whenever I have an idea, like my brain goes to planning and execution and, and whenever uh, fear creeps in, I'm like, okay, well, I try to kind of dissect it. I'm like, where is this fear coming from? So is it because I'm lacking a, a skill set or is it because I'm lacking financial resources? So I, I, Sometimes I mean it can it can last for an hour and sometimes it can take like a few, it, it can take a few days. So um, for me, it's always like let's find a solution, and then not let fear take over the whatever goals that I have to achieve. So uh, I think um, this is something that for me, thankfully, it comes like naturally. But I think that anyone can practice and uh, make it a daily kind of like process and just make it part of their DNA until it becomes like a natural thing for them. So yeah. I, I really like that answer. It makes it feel like it's more a skill set that you can kind of hone over time <clears throat> versus something that you're necessarily kind of born with, uh, which I think is really interesting. Which I think, Amina, your story is so interesting as well, right? Like 18 years as a chiropractor, and then you've decided to pivot and move into entrepreneurship. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, what that journey was and, and what it took inside of you to say, yeah, I can actually pivot from, you know, a fairly stable career to taking a chance on something that's new. Right. Um, yes. Uh, unlike Maria, I was just full of fear all the time. I had over the years uh, thoughts of, you know, I want to do this, but, you know, I think I'd love to bake on open my own bakery. Like all these thoughts would come up uh, throughout the years, but I, before I could fully explore and, you know, to see where it would take me, um, all these fears would come out, you know, self doubt. Can I do it? I'm already in my mid forties, you know, it's too late. Um, there's so much financial uncertainty if I were to just jump and do something different. I've gone to school for so many years, you know, am I just going to throw that away? And what are people going to say, you know? So all these things just kept coming up and I would just uh, stop it. But I think the turning point for me was in 2017 when my mom passed away. So that was, it, it really shook me to the core. And basically it took that event to kind of wake me up and say, you know what, like, you know, it's a cliche, but life is truly sh too short um, to not explore what you really want to do, what your heart is telling you to go after. So it really took that huge event for me to just, I, I think the fears just kind of, you know, went away. And I just thought, okay, you know what, like, this has happened and I have nothing to lose. What's the worst that's going to happen? Kind of told myself that. And then I think that gave me the courage to just leap forward. Thank you for 
for sharing that vulnerability because you're right I think there is a certain amount of vulnerability that also comes with with taking a chance um Salima you write about this subject uh, you started many companies and exited from them as well could you maybe talk to us a little bit about your journey as well but also what you've seen um, as you've been interviewing others uh, in in the development of your book thank you and it's an honor to be here and, and I'm really excited about everything we're sharing it yeah, so my story, well, it's actually, most of it's in my book, which I just released a couple of weeks ago, Innovation Starts With I. Uh, a lot of my personal stories, I, you know, it's weaving in a lot of tools and, and frameworks that I've created or I've adapted from other existing frameworks. Uh, but essentially, my story is really one of reinvention, um, you know, just reinventing through crises since I graduated from college in 2009 from McGill and, uh, you know, was confronted with the financial crisis and couldn't find a job in North America. So I decided to focus on giving, you know, doing service work and then volunteering in Brazil. And I thought I'd be volunteering at an orphanage, but they ended up putting me into Rio uh, to start up a language school to finance that orphanage. And it was there on the ground in a really complex uh, situation, uh, starting something in a really tough uh, you know, a country where it's tough to start uh, anything, businesses and in nonprofits. And then uh, you know, really trying to, to build something from scratch and not even knowing the local language. And I think that equipped me with a lot of the skills through giving, right? Because it was just, I was a volunteer. I was equipped with all the skills to become an entrepreneur. And it was then, you know, I then moved to Italy and uh, same, same problem, Euro crisis, couldn't find a job. Uh, ended up uh, starting to do some freelance translation work and it turned into, into a very successful business that I sold. Uh, and so, you know, just reinventing myself constantly during crisis is, is definitely something that I've, um, you know, I've, I've done really well. And I think part of it's, you know, being able to be okay with being uncomfortable. Um, I would say my biggest life quake was uh, when this very home I'm in right now I had a really bad fire. My building had a bad fire. So I was displaced for you know, several months. And it was then when I decided to uh, just check out of everything that I was busy doing um, since I also had been laid off from a couple of jobs. Like everything was just going wrong in my life. This was like about five years ago. And um, yeah, I ended up going on an eat, pray, self-love trip to India, Bali, Thailand, and trying to figure out who, who I was or who I was going to become, um, asking myself a lot of questions about my purpose and what I wanted to do. And it was then that I realized that um, you know, self-awareness is not just about knowing who you are through your own lens. It's about uh, knowing yourself as well through the lens of other people. Uh, in order to find my sweet spot, I had to look at not only what I thought I excelled at, but also what other people gave me praise or the positive feedback on, as well as what I love doing. And that gave me the ideas that I was open to testing. Um, and it was, that's basically how I've always, um, you know, operated is, is um, really trying to, to examine, you know, what can I do with what I have? Um, and then what do other people say that I'm great at? And, uh, and I think that's how, you know, you take an idea and you can iterate, and iterate. And, and that's how I've started different businesses. It didn't, I wasn't looking for a problem to solve. It was just a small idea that ended up uh, iterating into something much bigger. That's really cool. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this term lifequake. I know it's something that you use in your book. Um, and also maybe curious to know, I love, you know, love the idea of an eat, pray, love trip. I remember reading that book actually <clears throat> when I had the uh, opportunity to take a trip to Hawaii with my mom and just sat on a beach and read it kind of cover to cover. <clears throat> How do people find that opportunity if, uh, particularly now during COVID, if the opportunity to travel isn't there, but how do you actually just take that time and space? Because I imagine as an entrepreneur, there's no shortage of demands uh, on, on each of your times. But how do you find that time and space to just kind of sit down and focus and, and kind of do that hard work that you mentioned right there? Yeah, so I think there's different approaches to that, which I also talk about in the book. But uh, going back to what you mentioned, Lifequake, uh, Bruce Feiler uh, says that we have about three to five of them throughout our lifetime. And I think that they're actually, you know, you can look at it in a negative way, or you can look at it as, well, maybe this is an opportunity to reinvent myself. And that's how I sort of approached it. Um, you know, as, as Maria, you mentioned a little bit about this and, and Amina as well, like I, I lost my mother at the age of um, 16. And so for me, it was always about reinventing myself during times of crises and life quakes. I've always had to, you know, reframe how I saw them and figure out how to hustle to to, to survive or to, um, or to thrive during one. And I think right now we're seeing a lot of people experience uh, life quakes or something similar to one 
where they're feeling like they need to reinvent themselves. And I think instead of being uh, reactive the way that I have been at times, such as when the fire and all this stuff started coming down, um, I wasn't listening to my inner voice when all of that was going on. And I could have, you know, maybe taken a different approach. Uh, but now that I've uh, been focusing on, on listening more to myself and to what others tell me, um, I, my book basically equips people with the tools to proactively reinvent themselves because we're living through what I call the reinvention revolution right now, where we're seeing a lot of people uh, wanting to reinvent themselves or they're needing to reinvent themselves faster and more frequently than ever before. A lot of people are trying to jump into entrepreneurship or a lot of people are trying to look for some stability. Um, there's just a lot of shuffling going on right now, but definitely what we do see and the statistics show this is that, you know, just with the 40% increase in business applications being filed since um, the pandemic started, there's a lot of people that want to do their own thing or have something that's connected to their values and who they are. And I think that that's only going to continue. And that's something that, you know, I do with my business as well at Ripple Impact is we help entrepreneurs or hybridpreneurs who wear different hats, uh, you know, really uh, diversify and, and uh, grow a business around them. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Just that is the future of work that we're in right now. That's, that's really lovely. Thank you for that. Um, Maria, shifting over a little bit to you, I, uh, you know, when I read your bio, one of the things that struck me is a couple of things. I sometimes think fashion and creative industry is one of maybe the most underestimated industries out there, right? Like it's the GDP of it is $4 trillion. It employs almost 4 million people across, uh, across the world. You have been able to infuse, kind of going back to Salima's point around values, the value of sustainability uh, into the fashion industry. So can you talk to us a little bit about what made you, because um, I think as an entrepreneur, you're also really conscious of the shifts that are happening in the environment. So how you've been able to kind of meld what's happening from a sustainability and environmental perspective into the fashion industry and what that's actually looked like for you. Um, so my journey as a fashion designer, I think it's been a bit complex even for myself um, because uh, when I was a kid, um, I wanted to be a doctor like that was like I think because I was born in Afghanistan but then I was living in India uh, we lived in India for eight years so I've seen a lot of poverty but also like I think the education system in India was very like um, intense uh, so we had to like be super good students and like you know for me like being a doctor was the only thing because as a child I think I wanted to help people I wanted to in my head save the world um, and then eventually, uh, when I started working, when we came to Canada, I started working like at the age of 15 and, and I kind of stumbled into uh, the fashion industry at 16. So then um, eventually fashion just kind of happened to me. It was never like a chosen path. It was always like, okay, well, I'm going to work uh, in, a, in a boutique just so that I can, you know, help my mom pay for the rent and, and you know, like the whole family. And so then eventually, like everybody within the um, industry or stylists, when they would come in the stores, they would be like, oh, my God, you're amazing. You should pursue fashion. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm like I want to be a doctor. I'm a geek, you know. Um, so then eventually I'm like, you know what, I'm going to give it a try, because like if people are saying this and even when I was younger or in high school, I hated shopping. But my friends would always drag me because they would be like, oh, you're really opinionated and you have a good taste. And I'll be like, you're fine. I'll come with you. Uh, so then eventually I, I chose to study in fashion just out of curiosity. And then uh, I graduated like in my early 20s. And, and then for a very long time, honestly, secretly, even when I was working in the industry for other designers, I was kind of secretly mad at myself. I was like, why did I become a fashion designer? I wanted to be a doctor to save the world, right? So and then uh, with all the ups and downs and, and, and in 2014, a switch kind of happened in me. And I'm like, so why did I become a fashion designer? And how can I make a difference at this point if I now that I am one, right? Um, and my life purpose, I think that um, is connected. That's when I kind of like uh, did the connection. And I, I truly want to help kids. And I find that kids have like the, uh, they are the future of our you know, world and uh, and that's when I understood that the creative arts, uh, fashion, and um, in general has a lot of power to kind of like send this message in a very positive way and and um, fashionable way and cool way to educate the youth. And that's when it all started to make sense. And 
at that moment when I opened my atelier, I was like, okay, you know what? If I'm doing this, I want to do it the right way. I only want to focus on well-made products, uh, sustainably sourced uh, materials, and everything that I wanted to do at that moment, from that moment on, I tried to kind of like do it in a more sustainable way. Um, I know that couture and bespoke is super expensive, so you can only you know target a niche market. But then I, two years ago, um, not uh, yeah, two years ago I um, founded my brand uh, Vegan Size, which is more uh, catered towards a more younger generation, and it will be uh, a more um, accessible, I would say, brand. And with that, I hope that. Um, it will be easier to kind of like educate the youth, uh, whether it comes to the topic of sustainability, of innovative ways of doing things, or even a spirituality, something that's really dear to me, because like, I find that as a human being, when we know who we are, as uh, Salima also mentioned, you know, that's the moment when things become really easier. And, and when you love yourself and you do things for yourself first, that's when you kind of like do things for other people, the society, the world and, and the planet. So all of this will kind of, it's all connected for me. I know that we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but I think, I hope in the future uh, um, conferences, it's something, a topic that we will like, you know, cover a bit more because I will probably have more things done by then also but it is something that's really important for me I think that the future of this planet the environment is uh, something that we don't talk about often um, but I think that the fashion industry the creative arts and entrepreneurship in general I think that it's something that it's all interconnected and I think that it, it's a very powerful field and I hope that parents will kind of push their kids to uh, pursue careers in this field because not only it has a positive impact on ourselves, but also on other people and the planet as well. So, uh, yeah. Thank uh, you for that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, COP26 obviously just happened and I was watching with both my daughters and it's, it's just so fascinating because I remember being seven and nine and not really thinking that much about the environment. It was not something that we really learned about in school. And I now look at these two kids of mine who are all about recycling and all about reusing. And, um, you know, my older one has started, funnily enough, she something called OutSchool. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. I love this platform, though, because you can get your kids to dabble in things for like a week at a time and see if they enjoy it. And you've got everything from fashion to entrepreneurship um, on there. But it's it is I think that it is a it's a new generation and you know young people who are actually kind of leading the cause on the environment right now, which gives me a lot of hope. Similar to you, um, Amina, I know one of the things that sometimes comes up when people talk about entrepreneurship is just like balance, because I think when uh, when when you even think of the word entrepreneur, sometimes it can kind of be all consuming. You've got three young boys yourself. Um, and you also talk about kind of your husband's journey um, in your bio and your book as well. But maybe you can talk to us a little bit. And, and the intent here is to kind of take the fear out of entrepreneurship and the fact that, you know, you might have to be all in and what suffers as a result. But how have you managed to kind of strike that balance in your own life, uh, being an entrepreneur, also uh, obviously being a spouse, being, you know, the mom of three young kids, you know, and I'm sure there's lots of other things on the go, but yeah, maybe just talking to us a little bit about what, what balance looks like for you. Mm -hmm. Well, like you said, this whole journey for me uh, to start my own business started with my husband, actually, um, when he was diagnosed with a really severe autoimmune condition, and he was recommended to go on a low carb, uh, sugar free, gluten free, grain free diet. And um, as the main person who does all the cooking in the house, it was on me to, uh, you know, replace the foods that we used to eat and, you know, do healthy swaps and things like that. So as you said, like, we're very busy with the three kids and working. So I went out looking for um, these foods to buy in the store. And there was nothing, there was nothing, there was lots of gluten-free items, but not specifically low carb, sugar-free, grain-free. So, you know, that, like, I was already passionate about health and wellness from my career and, you know, trying to feed my kids healthy food. But that, that particular scenario, just, I thought, wow, like, it just, 
inspired me to go into this field because there was nothing out there in the market. I was into health and wellness. It was really important to me. So I thought, wow, this is like a great combination of the two things that I'm passionate about. And, you know, and I went running to an acquaintance of mine to ask her what she thought of this idea. But because you're so passionate about this, like it just kind of lit a fire under me that, you know, this is amazing. Like I'm, I've never felt so excited about something. Uh, this is something I want to do for me because it's always, you know, kids, this, that, everything kind of comes first before you. And this was something, you know, like I said, it was in my mid forties. And I thought, no, like this really makes me happy. And it, it just makes everything else around me easier if I'm happy. So I decided to pursue this. But as I did that, and I was so passionate about it, there was no, it didn't feel like work, right? So I was going like eight, 12 hours, you know, there was no stopping me because I was just so excited. And, you know, it was just kind of, I know it was a different kind of feeling I've never had before. So I was very passionate about that. And I just, I could work weekends. And that, you know, there's no TGIF or anything for me. It was just <laughs> work, work, work. So that, I think, after a year or so, I think it really threw me off balance. I realized I had um, sacrificed a lot of things that I enjoyed uh, before, you know, friends, uh, family, the kids. Like, there was a lot of things that kind of, you know, were getting left behind. So I think that was also another wake up call for me that no, you know what, like balance is the key here. You can't, you have to step back a little bit. Uh, you have to, you can do it all yourself because you're so set on a particular idea and you want to do it a certain way. No, you have to be flexible. You know, you have to um, give out some of the tasks to other people who would probably be able to do it way better than you can. And you have to kind of step back and look at the business and, you know, balance your family, balance your social life, your spiritual life, all those things. And that, you know, it didn't occur to me until I think a year, a year, year and a half into it, where I kind of started to feel that burnout because I thought it, I could do it all on my own. And, um, you know, I did realize that you have to definitely source out a lot of the support that you would need to, to build a business. Um, people that are way more knowledgeable than you and her group who've already done it before, basically. So I, I think that was the key for me to balance everything out. Yeah, that makes um, really a lot of sense. It's a bit of a support system, right? Both internally as well as externally. Absolutely. So in our last few minutes um, with all of you, um, you know, and we've got a lot of individuals joining us today who are thinking about going down this entrepreneurial path um, or maybe our entrepreneurs themselves and want to, you know, change things up a little bit. And Salima, maybe I'll start off with you, but what are kind of your last thoughts that you'd want to leave with people uh, who are watching today, uh, just in terms of what it takes to be an entrepreneur um, and just, yeah, a little bit of, a little bit of your journey and a little bit of your advice. And I'll be asking Maria and Amina the same question as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a few pieces I can I can share. And I think the first one is we need to focus more on being active leaders and not just thought leaders. I think that there is a lot of thought leadership in the world. There's a lot of information. Uh, it's getting easier to market ourselves more, especially with social media and every, you know, we have different identities on different platforms. And so it's very interesting how we have di different digital identities, depending on what platform you're using between Twitter and Facebook and Tinder. And it, it's just, it's so interesting. And so I think being able to focus on giving people value, uh, if you're trying to go into entrepreneurship, don't worry about branding. Don't worry about your website. Don't worry about your logo. Uh, focus on trying to get a happy customer, a happy paying customer, um, and try to make them, you know, wildly successful. Help them be extremely, extremely successful. Uh, because I think that, you know, from my experience as well as others around me and my own mentors, uh, you know, your success will come from helping other people be successful, and that's what active leadership is about: is actually taking action um, to to help other people versus, uh, you know, just putting stuff out um, to like a marketed 
business. Let's just say that. And so I would say, yes, uh, start with uh, the active leadership sort of approach. Um, another thing is that our sweet spot, um, you know, what we're really good at that or what we can become really good at isn't necessarily something that uh, we think that we're just passionate about and we should just do it. Uh, oftentimes the thing that is our sweet spot is, um, you know, really trying to, uh, develop those skills. It's not, and sometimes you have to work some jobs. You have to pay your dues. Uh, your business should be a matter of survival, your business model. It's not supposed to be something that you spend a lot of time planning, uh, start very small in scope. And I would even say, if you're trying to go into entrepreneurship, start with a project, uh, whether if you're in college and you, um, you know, want to start with a book, it doesn't have to be a five-star book. It could be, you know, something that, uh, it's your first draft. It's going to be your first time doing it. And so it's, it, it takes time and, and a lot of, you know, iterations and of the idea to get it to somewhere very successful usually. And so, uh, I would say start small in scope. If you want to start a podcast, you want to, uh, yeah, go through a 100 coffee challenge with the interviews that, you know, I've done with my book, with the, in, with the coffees that I did when I had to reinvent myself, that's a whole nother story during my life quake. And I needed a job and a visa. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, I think that, um, don't make it so complicated, uh, figure out what you can do with what you have and the people around you build your solidarity squad, you know, your, your circle of five, the people that, you know, you can count on that, um, will, will hold you accountable. Um, and it shouldn't be that stressful. Like it should be something that's small enough that you can achieve some level of success or failure and a failure that you can learn and then adapt and iterate from there. I mean, the goal is to fail fast, but also fail smart. Uh, and I would also say that, um, you know, the power of storytelling, just the way we are right now, very important. I think that um, it's key to, to share your story vulnerably, uh, start building your platform before you even, uh, you know, think it's important, but that will actually, uh, you know, building your community early on. Uh, and that's through, you know, helping other people be successful. That will actually, uh, they'll, they'll crave your success and they'll bring you uh, more business. They'll bring you, uh, you know, they'll, they'll want to be part of your journey. And it's just amazing to, to have um, community in that process. And uh, the last piece that I can share is the importance of having a team. I think being able to, uh, you know, manage your time really well because we can't get time back. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of us, especially women, uh, myself, I had to put aside a lot of the things I wanted to do with building a family and all these things. And I was like, well, I got to focus on my career. I got to do this. But now looking back, I'm like, well, maybe I could have optimized my time a little bit better. And now that I have a lot of, you know, time management tools under me, I've learned, you know, what can I delegate? What should I be doing? Uh, what can I delay for the future? Or what can I completely dump? And I have that right here on my, my whiteboard every day I wake up and I'm like, well, what can I, what do I need to do that nobody else on my team can do? And, um, you know, building a team, it was me and my assistant just a couple of years ago when I knew I needed to build a personal brand because I was going to become an author. And, and so I was like, well, I like being behind the scenes, but I, I know it's important to have, um, you know, it's the face of the company to, to have that brand out there. And so just having my assistant, um, you know, grow with me and, and we shared a vision together, we were able to build Ripple Impact. And, and that's how, you know, I, would, I loved helping entrepreneurs, but it was too much to just give them a lot of advice and give them a lot of information and education, just like many accelerators do. And so it was, you know, having her come on and, um, you know, say, well, maybe we need to help them with execution because they need help with execution. They need, you know, beautiful designed creative assets. They need, uh, you know, banners, they need social media graphics, they need media kits, they need, you know, websites and all these things. And I'm like, well, maybe even though that's super uncomfortable for me, we can combine our visions. And uh, because she was there early on, and, and this is the thing is a lot of uh, entrepreneurs think that you should do it all yourself. And I'm totally against that um, sort of uh, philosophy of you should do it all yourself. I think it's important to bring people on well before you think you even need other people because they will help uh, become part of the vision and share their vision as well, but also um, you know accelerate the growth of the business. And, and now we went from a team of two to a team of four to eight, and now we're 16 and, and um, we're going to be in Colombia, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to meet a lot of them this year between Colombia and Dubai. And it's just amazing that uh, we can have sort of a hybrid sort of remote team, but meet for offsites or, or trips and stuff like this. So I highly, highly recommend uh, building a team around you. And um, especially if you're wearing different hats, like myself as an author, speaker, professor, uh, you know, innovation strategist doing so many things. It's great to have uh, help that um, can support your vision, but they also can be part of it. Thank you. You can, you can literally feel the energy um, when you're, when you're talking about this topic. So thank you so much for, for being here and for sharing us that piece.
So I'm going to segue just a little bit. So Sleem, I know you need to leave. So feel free. That was the last question. Um, it was really awesome meeting you. Like, congratulations on your book. And yeah, I'm super excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have our, our book lunch party right now. So I'm going to head oh, to that. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for being here. Take All care. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, Amina. Bye, Maria. Um, okay. So Amina, over to you. Um, for all of the entrepreneurs and budding entrepreneurs who are, who are watching today, what are some of the kind of final words of wisdom that you'd like to leave them with? Um, I can only speak from my personal experience, what I've been through, but um, definitely if there's some thought or some idea that keeps creeping up and you want to pursue it, no matter what your age, you should definitely pursue it. Um, you have a dream and you need to, I think it deserves a chance to be explored. Uh, you can succeed, you, you, can, you can fail, but uh, either way, um, you won't have regrets after. Um, the first thing I would say is reach out to people, find mentors, um, people who have, who have succeeded in the business that you are interested in, talk to them. Uh, reach out to people you don't even know because you will be so surprised um, that people will get back to you. You know, if you reach out to 10, one person will get back to you. And um, I guess it's kind of like cold calling, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing how people are very willing to share their experience and their journey, and you will learn from that. Um, and as I said before, it, surround yourself with people uh, early on, hire people early on, because you cannot do everything. Uh, you cannot be the accountant. You can't be the one who runs your social media. You can't be delivering uh, your products to customers. You can't do it all. Um, in, the begin in the beginning, that's what I did. Um, luckily, I have a business partner. So, uh, you know, together we, we baked, we delivered to customers. We did the books, we did the social media, we did the marketing, we did everything. Um, but that's one thing, if, you know, and that's great. Like it, it just happened that way. But if you can uh, hire people uh, right off the bat, that would really help you go further faster. Uh, like Salima mentioned too. Um, uh, thirdly, I think be flexible and be open. Uh, as when you start, you have this very set idea, but I think it's really important to be flexible and open to opportunities that, you may not have considered going down that path. And uh, if you are open and flexible, I think it will uh, help you to pivot easier. If, you know, if things happen, you'll be able to be flexible and take another road to that same goal that you initially uh, had. And like I mentioned before, the balance is the key. Uh, it's really easy to get unbalanced quickly, but uh, just the awareness of um, everything has its place, work has its place, family has its place, your spiritual life has its place, uh, all the things that you enjoy, like you shouldn't, uh, you know, uh, just have one focus. But it is easy to get off balance, and the important thing is that you get back, you recognize that, you're aware of that, and you get back, uh, back in balance, whatever you have to do to get achieve that balance. Um, for us, it was once I realized that, um, we were doing too much to get that balance. We uh, merged with a larger food company that could help us, that had more resources than us and had money to invest, all the things that would help us grow. So we had to let go a little bit of our, uh, you know, hold on to our baby. So we had to let, let it go a little bit and let other people um, contribute their expertise uh, which would help us get further, which it did. You know, it got us into more retail stores. It helped us to expand into other provinces. So, you know, it does it does come with a lot of um, benefits to do that. And um, lastly, I think, and I think Salima said this too, is that be comfortable with uncertainty because going into your own business and being an entrepreneur, it's all about uncertainty. There's you know, highs, lows, successes, failures. Um, just be comfortable with that. Just make friends with uncertainty and just ride the waves and um, celebrate your wins, really. Thank That's you. 
Yeah, that's such a lovely, lovely note to to kind of segue into Maria. But I do believe that I think you know that that un- living with uncertainty is not something that um, I think any of us get used to growing up with. But it's definitely kind of a skill set that we need to hone. So Maria, over to you. So, say same question. Kind of what would you what what are some of the last thoughts that you'd like to leave with entrepreneurs and You know, I'm conscious that today we've also got a number of young people who are watching. And so maybe some advice for them as well in terms of how do you both get into entrepreneurship? And to Amina's point, how do you get used to uncertainty and and living with that and being okay with that? And also maybe just having some faith that at the end of the day, uh, things will hopefully work out. Yeah, um, I think for me, the, one of the most powerful things that has really worked for me personally is the power of focus and setting your intention straight. Um, oftentimes, I think that when we choose uh, or when we decide to become an entrepreneur, we have our families, our friends, our partners, or everybody has an opinion, right? They're like, oh, but you can do this, you can do that. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's really important to listen to your inner voice. Uh, it's important to listen to other people's opinions, but I think it's important to kind of regroup and, and refocus on what your intentions are. And once you have those intentions set, the first one would be for yourself. The second one would be for your clients. And then the third one, I think for me, this is really important is how and what are you trying to contribute in the future to the society and the world? Um because I think that the moment you have those intentions set, uh, your purpose kind of becomes clearer. Um, and and then the rest kind of becomes part of the execution. And then like in the creative field, uh, one thing that a lot of people uh, take granted for is that uh, we're often told, oh, this person is talented and this person is not. But I think that talent is something that, yes, you can be born with, but the power of um, honing your skill sets and, and really working on them and finding a very disciplined um routine where like you you have to like your where your work becomes your meditation and it becomes like part of your daily kind of tasks um no matter how distracting life can be whether it's like in your uh the the happy moments or the sad moments i think that it's important to really find that discipline and on a daily basis focus on it and have a creative space uh where whether you have the means or not, whether it's at home that you're starting or you're going to take a small space. Uh, I think that in the um, creative field, like you have to produce things, you have to kind of like have a tangible uh, space. And I think that that's something that I think that as a young person, um, we can focus on and really invest in it early on, because the moment you have that space, it really helps in, um, in your discipline and kind of like uh, practicing and failing and then improving yourself. And the moment you have all of that um, done on a daily basis, I think that it can only help. And, and yeah, So intention, focus, and uh, discipline. I love that. Thank you. And probably <clears throat> traits that anybody can apply. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, regardless of whether <coughs> you're in entrepreneurship or not. So that actually brings us to the end of today's conversation. Thank you so much for being part of uh, today's conference. If uh, those who are watching would like to learn more about um, all of the individuals we've interviewed today, you can check them out on their websites at mariacarini.com, salimavillani.com, and carbsmartexpress.com. Thank you so much for being with us today and I wish you all the best and I'm looking forward to following all of your journeys in uh, in the days and months to come. So thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you.